here and we're live. Well, welcome. Uh, I'm going to pull up the event page and let's see who is in the audience right now. I want to say uh, hello to a few people. I see Chris is out there. Welcome, Chris and Mark Sedell. I don't know who else is out there because I haven't checked in necessarily. We're going to go ahead and start rocking and rolling. You know, uh, <clears throat> I'm honored that you carved an hour out of your uh, out of your day to tune in and listen. And if I can pull this hangout back up so I can see what's going on, I'll be in good shape. There we go. I can see Keith. I can see myself. And so uh, I'm going to do everything I can to give you an incredible return on your time investment. And to get things started, I want to go ahead and share with you what the hashtags for the show are. They're Get Unstuck With Less, Feel Good and Be Happy. And for my special guest host, his hashtag is TSMA Academy. I'm sorry, TSMA Academy. Uh, that's his hashtag. And if you want to do us a favor, uh, well, hey, welcome, Tina. Good to have you in the show. I want to pull up the event page. Uh oh, I got something going on here. Hang on. Hello to a few people. What did I do? Chris is out there. Welcome, Chris and Mark. There we go. Aha. Uh -huh. I think Tina did that on her last hangout. Anyway, uh, I want to thank you all for tuning in. If you want to tweet this show for me, I'd be grateful. Uh, you can learn how to feel good and be happy on purpose. Uh, get stuck with less would be incredible. Uh, on today's show, Keith and I are going to discuss how to get unstuck so you can go get what you want and live life with a deep, fulfilling sense of purpose. And our special topic, as I said already, is feeling good and being happy. You know, getting stuck is easy. I've helped people get unstuck from some pretty bizarre situations. Uh, about a year ago, I had a, a local police officer reach out to me, and I could tell immediately from talking to him that he was manic, that he was depressed, that he was mean, and I mean a mean SOB, and that he was cheating on his spouse. And in about a 45-minute conversation with him, just loving on the guy, I helped him see that he was out of line with his values, and that was the reason why he was feeling the way he was feeling. And over the course of the next couple of weeks having you know weekly coaching sessions I helped him see that he was in the wrong role and uh, he decided to leave and went back to college and got himself an education and, that, and now is, is thriving as a uh, as an executive uh, I had a, a couple come to me and they were the relationship was really strained and the husband was ready to call it splits and they had been married that long and his wife was a cop incidentally and so I, you know, I asked both of them if they'd be willing to let me talk to them individually. And so I talked to the wife, and I immediately knew that she wasn't lucid, meaning that her faculties weren't all with her. And the more I started digging, the more I realized something was in control of her other than her own mental faculties. Well, I found out what was happening was that she was taking Ambien, and Ambien was messing with her head. So we got her off the Ambien, and everything went back to normal. They got unstuck, and their relationship is better than it's ever been. I had a financial advisor come to me. He'd reached about 300000 in income, but he knew he had more potential. And uh, so over the course of about a year's worth of coaching, we quadrupled his income. Uh, <laughs> one particularly interesting case, and, you know, Keith and, and the audience members, when somebody gets stuck, there's varying degrees of being stuck. There's from this, you know, it's it's... Uh, one question away from being unstuck to a you know a year-long process of getting unstuck. It just depends on how tangled up the person is. But I had this guy meet. He asked me to meet him, and uh, he wasn't even a client. And so I said, okay, I'll meet you. So we went down to a local wing joint here and, and had a beer together. And I'm sitting there talking to the guy, and I could tell, man, he was carrying around the weight of the world. And, you know, his shoulders were sunken like this, and his head was tilted down like this, and he wouldn't hardly even look up at me. And I started talking to him, I realized that he was carrying around all of his past, all of his history, all of his bad mistakes, and all that stuff. So I asked him, I said, okay, I want you to do something with me. And I stood up like this, and I asked him to stand up too. And I said, uh, man, that weight you're carrying around is really heavy, isn't it? He said, man, you just don't know. I said, let me have it. And he said, what do you mean let me have it? I said, hand those suitcases to me. So he reached over and handed them to me. And I'm standing there like this. He reached over and handed them to me, and I went, oh, oh my God, they are heavy. 
And then I let him down. I put him down on the ground. I stood back up straight and I grabbed him by the arm and I walked him out of the bar and down the sidewalk. And I said, you know, <clears throat> so I made a deal with the bar owner before we came in here that I was going to help you unload. I was going to leave the suitcases in there. And his job was to go out back and throw them in a the dumpster. I said, so you don't have to carry that load around with you anymore. I said, you know, we're going to keep walking. We're going to talk. And I'm going to get you focused on what you need to do. And life's going to be much better for you from this moment on. Well, the, uh, you know, the, the uh, fairy tale ending is that the guy went on. He never went back and picked his suitcases up. And now he's thriving in his life. Uh, I had another interesting case with a CEO. He had an $11 million company, 100 employees. He'd been in business for 20-some-odd years, and his business rolled over on top of him. He was over $2 million in debt to the IRS, and uh, he didn't know which way it was up, man. His, his mind was so scrambled because of the shame that he was feeling and the guilt that he was feeling and the, and the, uh, and the pressure of the circumstances having to deal with debtors and with the IRS and not knowing whether to lay people off and whether to liquidate, whether to go. He just didn't know. The first time that we met, I got lost in his head. I mean, it was so bad. That's, I went up to the dry erase board and I drew a picture after he left of what I felt like he looked like. And, and the picture was just scary. Well, over the course of about a year, I helped him untangle it all. He navigated the most difficult year of his life and was able to salvage his business. All because he had somebody there to kind of bounce things off of and to help him ask himself questions better than he was asking himself and you know I, I got you know I could go on and on and on with situations like that where people have gotten stuck and through effective coaching have helped them you know put their lives back together again and, and start moving forward and to you know go after what it is that they really want in life and it's especially important and, and the reason I picked this topic uh, feel good and be happy is because it's really, really difficult to make bad decisions if you feel really good about yourself and about your life. I mean, think about it. If you're feeling good, you, you don't have any reason to make a bad decision. So, I mean, I'm sure you've been driving down the road before where you felt really, really good and somebody cut you off and you just kind of let it go. But if you're not feeling so hot and that same person cut you off, then you, you know, you get plumb beside yourself. So, <clears throat> I, Keith and I are going to dig into this topic uh, for a little while, and then at the end of the show, I'm going to open the, uh, I'm going to keep the hangout going and take questions from the audience. I've opened up the Q&A, so if you'll put your questions in the, yeah, right there. Okay, got it. Uh, there you go. Thank you, Jason. Put your questions in the uh, in the in the Q&A, and then at the end of the show, I'll spend as much time as I need to answer as many questions as are asked time permitting, okay? And then finally, before I, before I move on to this uh, opening call to action, I want to say this. There's no shame in getting stuck. Everybody gets stuck. In fact, if you're on this uh, HOA today, including Keith and myself, we're all stuck because none of us are tapping all of our potential. I know for a fact I have so much potential still left in reserve that I haven't tapped yet. But I'm working on tapping more of it. And day after day after day, I get better and better and better tapping it. And so, <laughs> you know, take heart. If you're stuck in a worse place than I am right now, it's okay. Everybody gets stuck. The only shame is not doing everything possible, everything within your power to get unstuck. So here's what I hear every day, and I bet you can relate to this. I'm stressed out. I don't have a life. I'm slowly sinking, I can't make ends meet, I can't seem to get ahead, maybe I just don't have what it takes, everything's urgent, I'm stuck, I'm burned out, I'm toast, no one really cares or values me, I simply don't have the time or resources to do it all, I'm kissing up, my, life's lack, my life lacks meaning, something's missing. I mean, I hear that stuff every day. It seems like there's an epidemic of people who feel exactly like that. And you would think that those conditions would prevent somebody from being able to feel good and, and, and to be happy. But actually, the opposite is true, and Keith and I are going to discuss that uh, today. So I want you to do something for me right now. If you're in the audience, and Keith, I want you to follow suit, okay? I'm going to do the same. I want you to sit up straight. I want you to pull your shoulders back. I want you to take a deep breath. 
Take a deep breath with me. Lift your chin up. Open your eyes wide, and then I want you to smile from earlobe to earlobe until you feel like your face is going to break. Come on, smile. Now, if you follow that routine with me, if you did what I asked you to do, I can guarantee you're feeling better right now because a physiological change affects the way that we feel. And let me give you an example. Go to a park bench and watch people walking by. You can pick out the ones who feel really good and the ones who feel miserable. The ones who feel miserable have their head down and their shoulders are slumped and they're moving slowly and they have no real uh, driver motivation. The ones who feel great, they got a pep in their step. Their shoulders are back, their heads up, their eyes are looking forward. Physiological changes, forcing yourself to, to make a physiological change is a great way to help yourself feel better in the moment. So thank you for following my call to action. And uh, now I want to acknowledge out loud that as a result of taking those actions, oh, no, no, I'm sorry, bad note, bad note, sorry. <laughs> Today my guest host is Keith McMean. And, uh, you know, Keith is the, is the very first guy that I met on Google+. Keith is over in Whitehaven in Cumbria in the U.K., and I wrote a blog post, and I shared it into the public stream, and Keith read it, and he shared it with David Amerlin, and David Amerlin shared it with his circle, and the next thing you know, man, I got, I don't know, 100 followers from that one blog post. So I'm especially fond of Keith for being the very first person to share my content, and since that time, I've gotten to know him really well. Uh, Keith runs a company called the uh, Social Marketing Academy, and uh, I think Keith is doing some incredible things with that business, and I'm looking forward to, to having this discussion with Keith tonight. Uh, I, he also has some other talents that, uh, that just astonish me. I, I have a few talents, but I don't have any of the so, sort of uh, creative talents like uh, playing music or you know, doing art, and Keith happens to do both. He's a drummer and a watercolor artist, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful to know you, Keith, and I want to thank you for coming on to the show and, and agreeing to be my guest host and, and uh, for asking me really great questions and helping us go where we can help the people who are in the audience feel better and, and, and be happier. So, Keith, welcome. Say hello. Hi, Les. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here, and uh, I just hope I can live up to everything that Les has said about me. Um, one of the things for me, uh, especially on Google+, Plus, is how welcoming everyone is. And I think, as, as Les has demonstrated by uh, the stories that he's told, I think people do find genuine happiness on Google+, Plus because I think there's lots of people that can help. Now, Les has asked me to share some of my thoughts, and, and probably one of the most unhappiest times that I had uh, was a, as an artist. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, uh, I had a gallery, and I taught lots of different people from lots of different countries uh, watercolor painting. And it got to the stage in 1996 when I had to make the decision, do I close the gallery, or, or do I just forget about the web? And I was really interested in the web, but I really love my art too. And that was probably, I could see the sense of it because there was a lot more money in the web, uh, which has proved to be. Uh, I was a really good teacher of art, even though I wasn't professionally trained. I was, I'm completely self-taught in everything that I do, my drumming and everything. Um, I'd see myself as a guide. I used to guide people through and, and teach them what I do, which stood me in good stead for everything that I've done since. But one of the happiest times was starting the gallery and, and being recognized as an artist. One of the saddest times was recognizing that I had to close the gallery. And, and I think as we explore this topic, that will probably resonate with a lot of people that have had to do something sad to, to, be, to do something that's going to make them happy. I look back now, and it probably didn't make me as sad as I thought it did at the time. It, it, it was probably more enlightening than it was sad that I actually I realized what I needed to do. And I think that's the, probably the watchword of today, of, of tonight's or today's talk, is that always look out for those little signs because they do present themselves. So what I would like to do, Les, is start off with the opening question, if I may. Sure. And, and for me, uh, 
far too many people are stuck feeling bad and feeling unhappy. What do you think contribu contributes to this epidemic and why? Well, based on my own life experience and interactions with clients over the years, uh, it's because they've gotten out of practice. And, and, <laughs> and what I mean by that is that their, their, their habits of thought have them sort of practicing being unhappy, practicing feeling bad. And so the, the conversations that they're having with themselves are, uh, you know, sort of prone to making them feel less than good, making them feel less than happy. The thing that most people don't understand, especially people who aren't happy, is that their unhappiness and or their feeling bad is, is a choice that they're making. It's like, uh, you know, there's a, a great analogy that uh, I've modified a little bit about uh, an Indian chief talking to his grandson, and the grandson says, you know, uh, grandfather, please tell me a story. And the, and the grandfather says, okay. He said, there's two wolves on the inside of us. One is positive and the other is negative. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> they're, they're always fighting with each other. And, of course, the young grandson says, well, who wins? And the grandfather says, well, the one I feed the most. So, you know, feeling good and being happy, the short version is, is, a, is something that you have to practice to become good at. And I know for a lot of years, because of circumstances and, and conditioning in my past, I feigned being happy. In other words, I put on this facade that appeared to everyone who uh, interacted with me that I was happy, but secretly I was miserable. And so in this particular, in the particular way that I was going about trying to be happy, I was trying to fake my way into being happy, and, and that wasn't enough. It wasn't until I began reorganizing my thoughts and began practicing a very structured way to think about my life and about my situation that I began to experience more and more freedom and more and more happiness. So the real short answer to the question, Keith, is that it's because they've gotten out of practice. They, they develop the habit of being unhappy, the habit of feeling bad. You know, uh, there's a famous uh, psychotherapist, Dr. Eric Byrne, wrote a book called uh, Games People Play. And he looks into transactional analysis and and uh, he said there's three basic kinds of people in the world. There's victims, uh, persecutors, and rescuers. And those three people go around looking for each other all the time. So the persecutor will go find the victim, and, you know, they fall in love with each other because they're getting what they need. And the rescuer finds the victim and beats up on the persecutor so that he gets what he needs. Well, there's people who go around hating because they've become, they become conditioned. They develop the habit of, of learning to, to hate other people. And there are people who are exceedingly happy, and they go around infecting up other people with their happiness. And it's, it's not because they were uh, hit with a happiness wand or an unhappiness wand. It's because they began practicing at some point in their life one or the other, and they got really good at it. And so the key to, you know, the short answer to going from or making the shift from feeling bad and being unhappy to the opposite is to start practicing a structured way to, uh, you know, to feel better and to, and to be happy. Like, for instance, maybe putting on your checklist first thing in the morning when you wake up to do exactly what I just took you through in the call to action, right? Sit up straight, lift your shoulders back, lift your chin up, look straight forward, and then smile from earlobe to earlobe and hold it. It, uh, if you practice that long enough, eventually you'll get to the place where when you wake up in the morning, you actually feel good. I, th I think that's a, a, a really excellent point. And one of the things for me is either you're saying that the stuff out there or the things that happen have little to do with people's unhappiness, unhappiness than less. I'm sorry? What I was, what's sort of running through my mind from listening to what to what you were talking about there is do you think or are you saying that stuff out there or the things that happen have little to do with people's unhappiness? Absolutely. 
And I'm not saying that in the moment when something happens that you don't temporarily feel unhappy and feel bad. Because stuff does happen that's pretty hard to, you know, to be happy about. But that doesn't mean your whole life becomes unhappy because of that event. It just means that while you're dealing with this event, that you're experiencing those negative emotions. So <clears throat> the only way I know how to help people wrap their mind around that a little bit is to share a couple of my backstories. So obviously when my first son died, that was not a happy time for me, and I certainly didn't feel good. And because I didn't have the skills that I have now, I carried that pain around with me for quite a while. It took some time, but I eventually began to untangle it all and got completely untangled from it so that now I can talk about it without getting all emotional and being ineffective. Uh, because my frame of reference when I think about my son isn't that he's not here with me. It, it isn't that he's dead. It's that he lived and that he made major contributions to my life. And I have all these wonderful images and conversations stored in my psychology that I reference when I think about my son. So <clears throat> that takes uh, uh, some courage. It takes courage to say, you know what? It's okay for me not to mourn the loss of my son forever. It's okay for me not to stay stuck in grief and in sorrow. It's okay for me to look at it the way that I'm looking at it. Where is it written that I have to feel bad forever because my son is no longer with me? Uh, later on in life, you know, that, that happened in my 20s. Later on in my life, I lost both of my siblings. You know, and if you've studied grief at all, you know there's like five stages of grief or seven stages of grief or four stages of grief, depending on who uh, wrote about it and talked about it. And, you know, I completely be believe that there are stages of grief, just like there are stages of becoming happy. Uh, I know for a fact that I'm at a much higher level of happiness today than I was a year ago. And a year from now, I'll be at a much higher level than I am today. There's stages or phases with everything. But, you know, I had to go through all five stages of grief with my son when he died because I didn't have the skills that I have now. When my sister died, I was 38. No, no, when, I, when my sister died, she was 38. I had more highly developed skills, and I felt a whole lot less unhappiness, and, and I felt bad far less amount of time at her death than I did with my son because I had practiced looking at that death properly. I put it into proper perspective and saw it for what it was, not worse than it was, but what it was. And how can I move forward from that, right? How can I move forward from that and take away all the wonderful contributions that she added to my life and use that to be more effective in my life? Because that's what she would want for me, right? And if you ask my five-year-old son what he would want from me, it'd be the same thing. Now, my brother died uh, about three years after my sister died, and it was a freak death. And uh, I was able to go through all five stages of grief with my brother's death in almost in a decision, which meant that I spent very little time in sorrow and in grief with my, with my younger brother. And so, you know, now I'm without siblings. Now, I understand that I didn't get to this place overnight. I've been working on this for quite a while. And now, because I understand it so well, I'm able to help other people do the same. So I'm not saying I can help you, Keith, if somebody died and you, that was really close to you get to where I am overnight in a single coaching session. But I can certainly help you get untangled from it faster mm -hmm. than maybe you could on your own because that's what I do. So <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question more specifically, but, yeah, the, the, the circumstances out here – have very little to do with why somebody feels bad and is unhappy. It has everything to do with how they process what happens out here. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, what, what, one of the things, and, and it really resonates with me because um, a couple of years ago, my eldest brother died of cancer. And um, I, I think listening to, to what you've said, um, and especially in such a heartfelt way, 
and and we all you know can sympathise and empathise in in varying degrees. But I think that I'll give you my take on it, Les. And I think listening to what you've said and listening to what to what other people have told me and you know things that I've helped them with, not on the same level that you do. But I think you get to a, a stage where it's just got to be a series of choices. You have to make the choice to stop grieving. You have to make the choice to move on. It, it, choices might be the wrong word. It could be decision. It, whatever sits best with you. I think what, what you need to do, or, or probably what you have to do, is make the choice just not to grieve anymore, to, to find a better place. So keeping that in mind, do you think that, that people who are inherently unhappy just just make the wrong choices or decisions well I don't you know everybody's born happy in my opinion I, I think we come into this world innocent you know we need our butts wiped we need to be fed we need to be loved and cuddled and unfortunately that doesn't happen for a lot of people and in those early stages or in those early years that's where most of the conditioning happens that's when we're most receptive to taking in the world it's after we become jaded, you know, like the song Super Tramp, right? When I was young, life was so wonderful. Well, then they sent me away and taught me how to be logical and reasonable and critical and cynical and blah, 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 blah. And we learn how not to be happy and how not to feel good. When what we should be doing is exactly what we did when we were kids, right? We should be skipping and dancing and playing hide and seek and swinging on the swings and jumping up and down in mud puddles and and whatever it is that, you know, turns your crank. For me, I love doing all those things. I'm 52 years old, and I do them unapologetically as if nobody's watching because I, I want to feel good, and I want to be happy. And here's the way I view it. If I'm going to go from here to there anyway, right, Let, let's say for purposes of this discussion that I am going to go from – this moment until tomorrow at this time, right? Provided I don't die, I am. <laughs> I'm going to go from this moment till tomorrow at this time. Well, I have my mind framed in such a way that I'm going to be as happy as I can possibly be, no matter what happens in that 24-hour space of time, because that's my focus. I, you know, the way I say it, hey, if I got to go anyway, I might as well choose to feel good and be happy. That's a discipline. It's something that you have to practice doing, and I practiced it and practiced it and practiced it until I mastered it, until it became who I am. And now, you don't, I mean, I wake up in the morning with a spring in my step and a smile on my face, ready to tackle the day. I go to bed the same way. When I go out into traffic, I go out into traffic with great anticipation. When I meet people, I meet them with a big smile on my face, ready to engage and to connect. And, you know, does stuff happen? Absolutely, all the time. But I've practiced it. It's become my discipline. And so that's my world. That's my life. It's the way I live. And it makes things so much better. I think, I think it definitely does, Les. I mean, I, I, to me, w w one of the great things for me, and, and especially what brings it back, and I, th and I hope it does for, for everyone who's listening, is that you you think back to the choices that you made when you were younger, the things you probably could have done that would have made you happy. But to me, I, I try not to look back, and I, and I don't look back very often. I, I tend to either live in the now or live in the, in the future. But one of the things I tend to think is that it's the foundation for who I am now. I, I, if I hadn't have made all the mistakes and all the frustrations and all the, pardon the technical term, shit that have, has come along, with you know, with everyone's life, yeah, it doesn't prepare you for what for what comes when you've got your own family, when you've got grandkids, when you've got a mortgage and a car, to, and all the stuff, all the did a day that comes along with it. That's if you can be happy with with all of that or what's termed your lot, then I think it's a it's a fantastic a fantastic discipline to have, I and agree. it's a fantastic mindset to have. I think there's too many people that spend too much time worrying about what's going to happen next week, next month, next year. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I can tell you that 
once you get there, it's totally different to what it was, what you imagined when you started. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I, I'm a big Stephen Covey fan, and one of the things he talks about in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People is circle of concern, circle of influence, which basically means that are you focused on the things you can do something about or on the things you absolutely have no power to influence or do anything about? If you're spending time there, then you're wasting your time. You're wasting your creative energy. You're wasting your lifeblood. And you can't be happy in that space. You have to learn to shift yourself into, okay, I can't do that and that and that, but I can do this, so I'm going to focus myself on doing this. Same thing applies to, uh, to happiness. I can't be happy about that, but I can be happy about this. Yeah. So this is what I'm going to focus on. I'm going to let that take care of itself because I can't do anything about it. That makes yeah. sense? It, it does. So to me, well, it, it took me a lifetime to get to this stage or the 55, 56 years I've been on this planet. But well, now, now I just think, right, today deal with the stuff that I can deal with. Whatever comes on my radar that I can't deal with, why waste time thinking about it? Yeah. It's, you know, it's wrote, wasted time. I wrote a post, Keith, and it, it, it didn't get near as much traction as I expected it to get. And I don't know why. Maybe because of the headline or maybe because it's 3,000 words. <laughs> <laughs> But the post was titled, Three Cunning Lies That Are Keeping You From Being Successful and Enjoying a Wonderful Life, or something along those lines. And, and in that, uh, I break down the three things, three lies, that I believe keep people from really, really enjoying their life. And I'll summarize it and say, and say this, that life is about life and death. It's about pain and happiness. It's about success and, and failure. It's about uh, hot and cold. <laughs> it's about spring, summer, winter, and fall. And the people who really thrive in life are the ones who look at both and ask them to dance, and they've learned how to master the dance. And so it doesn't matter what they're faced with. If they're faced with death, they look it in the eye, they ask it what it wants to teach them, they invite it out onto the dance floor, and, they, and then they whisper into its ear, you know what, this is my dance, baby. This isn't your dance. Let me show you how to get off this dance floor as quickly as possible. And then they escort it out the back door, and then they move on with their life, right? I mean, to use a great analogy, and I use that with my clients a lot, when you encounter fear, when you encounter pain, when you encounter an errant thought, you know, something up in here that just doesn't line up with the world that you're living in, you, the way to get past that is to look it in the eye and say, okay, pain, why are you here? Why am I feeling you? And I'm talking about emotional pain. Physical pain, too, but emotional pain, right, which we all feel, even though guys don't like to talk about it, we all feel it. You look it in the eye and you say, why are you here? What is it that you want to teach me? Teach me what it is that I need to know, and then let's dance, baby, because uh, I'm the person who's leading this dance, not you. And then you lead that pain off the dance floor. You know, it's the way that I look at emotional pain is like this, Keith. Pain is C4. And if I can ignite it, it'll blast through the barriers between me and where it is that I want to go. If I hold on to it and try to medicate it and try to cope with it and try to, you know, numb it, then it stays with me and I don't, I don't ever get past that barrier. Mm -hmm. So I look at emotional pain as, okay, it's here for a reason. And the reason is not because of something that's out here, because something's going on up in here. I've got to get my thinking aligned properly and organize my thoughts so that this pain literally leaves so that it blasts through that barrier and I can go to the next level of success and achievement and happiness and feeling good in my life. With, you know, I mentioned uh, death. I'm not just talking about literal death, somebody dying in your, in your life. I'm talking about stuff in here that needs to die. Mm. I mean, here's a really, really good example. Okay, so mom and dad tell little Johnny when he's four, five, six years old, Johnny, don't talk to strangers. That is important information. Little Johnny needs to know not to talk to strangers because we live in a dangerous world, right? The problem with that programming is that mom and dad don't teach little Johnny when he's 14, 15, 16 that it's okay to talk to people now. And so he goes through high school feeling awkward because he doesn't like to talk to strangers, so he won't do debate, he won't do theater, he won't do this, he won't do that. 
He won't stand in front of the crowd, you know, and do his book report. He, all that stuff, he made, he's made to feel really awkward because that programming is in control. And then he goes out into the world where he's got to interact with people in the business world, and he can't deal because he feels so insecure and awkward and, and weird. He doesn't know why, and it's because that programming is still in control. He didn't update it. That thought needs to die. Well, I had the same problem, and, and that's the reason why that story is so real to me. I understood what that meant. Even though in life I was very charismatic and always led everybody, that I, all my friends, I was the leader. When it came to standing up in front of people or networking in a, in a strange environment or doing anything where I was in the front of the room, it was really, really uncomfortable for me. But I, I went in and I said, you know what? These thoughts are not effective. They're not helping me realize my dreams. I got to reorganize them. I got to discard some of them. I got to put some new data in there and give me give myself some more options so that I can be effective, so that I can get to what I want in life. And and that's what I did. Now I can stand up in front of ten thousand people and you know take my pants off and <laughs> and, and dance and and skip and whatever because you know I've worked it all out. I think and, that's the and the last one, Keith, and this is, you know, I watched a great video, and I can't remember the lady's name, and I, I sure wish that I could give her credit because she did such a spectacular job. It was a TED Talk. Uh, and she said that uh, one of the most devastating words in a person's vocabulary is I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. And it's that, and I agree with her, fine is not okay. Fine means that you're settling. Fine means that you're stuck in your danger zone, which is basically your comfort zone in my mind. I live in a, an environment that I've set up for myself that's a culture of discomfort. I'm always a little bit uncomfortable about the things that I'm doing. I'm pushing myself further in my fitness routine. I'm pushing myself further with my nutrition. I'm pushing myself further with my you know, activities on Google+. I'm pushing myself further in every area of my life and it took me a while to get here. One of the ways that I was able to get here, though, was through structure. And, and, and I'll say this to everybody in the audience. Freedom and happiness and feeling good and success require discipline. You can't achieve them without it. Mm. And for me, you know, my thoughts weren't organized properly enough in here that I could do it in autopilot mode. So I had to build the structure you know, on my computer, excuse me, on my computer and create an outline of the things that I need to do every single day mm -hmm. to stay on track so that I'm doing them consistently because it's through consistent action that we make progress, that we win, that we succeed. And so I, I created a very elaborate uh, spreadsheet, so to speak, with all of the activities that I want to engage in. I mean, drink 16 ounces of water when I get up, stretch after I drank the water, Meditate and pray for a little bit after that. Read 15 to 30 minutes worth of great, inspiring content. And I could go down the list of the things that I do every single day that sets my intention, puts me in the, points me in the direction that I want to go so that I can feel great, so that I can be happy, and so that I can contribute fully to everybody that I encounter day in and day out. That's how disciplined I'm learning to live my life, Keith. And... I know there's some people on the planet that are the exception to what I'm saying, but if you looked at their thinking and plotted it out on paper, you would see that they're organized exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. Because you can't be free, you can't be happy and feel good unless you're disciplined, unless you have structure to your life yeah. or to your thoughts. And, and that's a, a really good point because I think one of my favorite quotes is, good stops us from being great. And, and that's something that, that's sort of like a, a bit of a, a, a tagline for me. If you settle for good, you're never going to be great. Right. But if, if you take the structured element of what you've just explained and you take that into something like art and you look at someone like Picasso, even though it didn't look like it, Picasso was very structured. If you look at a lot of his line drawings, that's how he started. It all started from a really tight structure. Yeah. It might have ended up looking free. But it didn't start out that way. That was just his fantastic, phenomenal talent. And, and I think that goes hand in hand with what you say, Les. I think anything 
that you do that requires discipline, choices, decisions, whatever. You've got to make that choice and that decision to do it, not just to skirt around the edges of it. Oh, so, so, so going on from that, let's take the scenario that everything just goes like pear-shaped. It, it's upside down. You just, you know, there's nothing you can do in a person's life or his business life. Is it then possible for them to become happy and and you know and feel good about themselves? Does that ever work? You know, if it's really gone pear-shaped. I, you know, I have clients have been with me now for a while, and the answer, I mean, if you ask them the question, they would say yes, because life still comes at them, man, and it comes at them fast, because a lot of them are very successful professionals, very successful business people, and if you're doing anything at all in this life, you're going to you're gonna fail, you're not going to win, you're, you're going to encounter challenges and hardships that you've never encountered before, and the higher up you get on the ladder, the more difficult they get. You know, people think that because somebody's reached a certain level of success that their challenges and hardships aren't as difficult as somebody who's who's stuck in mediocrity, and that's not the case. They're, every bit is difficult. Every bit is hard. The only difference is that they've organized their thoughts. They've organized the way that they think differently. So when they encounter something like that, they don't shy away from it. They run towards it. It's like, you know, there's another great analogy that I like to use. If you watch the buffalo... Uh, when a storm is blowing in, when a thunder, major thunderstorm is blowing in, you know, cows will lay down and turn their back to it, right? But a buffalo runs and charges towards it because they know something. And, and if the mountains are close by, they'll run right up to the base of the mountain and face the storm. And what happens is the storm passes over them quicker. They, ha they don't have to endure the storm as long. So when things go sideways or roll over on top of you or get upside down or implode or explode, whatever it is that they do, the way to get past it fastest is to look it in the eye, you know, acknowledge that it hurts, you know, make the choice that you're going to get through it as quickly as you can possibly get through it, and then ask it for the lessons it needs to teach you, learn those lessons as fast as you can, and Lead it out onto the dance floor. Ask it to dance and say, come on, baby. This is my life. This is my business. This is my world. I'm taking the lead, not you. And then you lead it across the dance floor, open the exit door, and push it out where it belongs, close the door, and get back to living your life so that you can be effective, so that you can continue going after what it is that you want, and so that you can feel great and be happy. That's the short answer to your question or the simple answer to your question. In reality, it's more complex than that because if you don't have the, the discipline to take those action steps, then you're going to stay, you know, stuck in that challenge and that hardship much longer than necessary. You're going to feel much worse than you need to feel and be much unhappier than you need to be unhappy. So, you know, well, Sorry, Les, what, what I want to do then is I just want to throw another question in for you. Right? Love it. J just, on the, just on the back of this, right? I, I, my middle name should be procrastination. Right? I think my, my poor late dad should have known that. So if I came to you and, and you realized after, say, 20 minutes of, of the first consult mm -hmm. that I wasn't disciplined in any shape or form and, and you were thinking, you know, this is going to be really difficult because this guy's all over the place. What would be my process to become more disciplined? Because it, it took me a long time. I mean, if I think if I'd had a mentor and, and a mentor like you, I, I probably would have been disciplined 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. You know, and I probably would have been in a totally different place to where I am now. So, so anyone who's you know who's watching, mm -hmm. if if there's a set of I don't know things that people can do. To become more disciplined, a set of rules or, or structures, what would that be if that isn't putting you on the spot too much? Because I know what I'm like. I just, I just wrote a great blog post uh, about this topic, and I actually had a conversation via comments with JD about this. But you, uh, Keith, you really got to gotta stick your hand up. You know, that's the universal stop sign, right? 
you stick your hand up, you look at yourself in the mirror, and you say, "That's it. I'm done. I'm not going to be. Pro I'm not going to procrastinate any longer. I'm not going to be distracted any longer. I am going to rewrite the story. I'm going to recast myself in the role of being laser focused." I'm going after my dreams. I'm going after what it is that I want to go after, and nothing's going to get in my way. Once you make that decision, and you make it resolute, you know, there's another story that I want to share with you, Keith, and this is something that the highly successful people have done. There is uh, an emperor, right? He's got this army under his charge, and they're taking lands one after the next, right? In the, old, in the old times, and there's this one particular land across the sea that they have failed to take over and over and over again. So they go to try and take the land, and they fail, and they come back with their tails between their legs, and they, uh, you know, the king or the emperor retreats to his to his palace, and he brings in, you know, the same people that he's been counseling with forever, and uh, he realizes that they're just regurgitating the same crap that have, they've been regurgitating, so he dismisses them. You know, and fed up and 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 disillusioned by the whole thing, you know, he begins to just simply meditate about the, the problem. And well, after a little bit of meditation, you know, he goes on about his business, and then he encounters this this uh, peasant. And the peasant had been very successful in his business, right? And he got into a conversation with the peasant, and the peasant. And he was lamenting to the peasant about his troubles, not being able to conquer the land. And the peasant said, well, emperor, if I may speak, he said, may I ask a question? And the emperor said, sure. He said, well, why don't you burn your boats? He said, what do you mean burn my boats? We'll have no way to get back. He said, yeah, but if you burn your boats and win the war, you'll be able to take their boats back. <laughs> right? Take the enemy's boats back. So, I, yeah, I think that's a great analogy for the way that we're supposed to live our lives. So many people have plan B and C and D and E and F. And what they really need to do is just get all in, burn the boats, and just keep moving forward because that is the way to win at life. You know, listen, you have, I have, and anybody who you know who's achieved really high levels of success, let's, let's throw a few names out there, Tiger Woods, uh, Anthony Robbins, uh, you know, President Obama, uh, I don't know who the, who's the, the Queen of England, well, not the Queen of England, we won't use her because that may not fit into this conversation very well. Any, anybody who's reached a high level of success, on their path to getting to their level of success, they encountered countless obstacles and barriers and hardships and challenges. But because they burnt their boats and didn't have a plan B, they had to align their thinking in such a way that they were able to navigate around or through or under or over those barriers, those obstacles, those hardships and to get to where they wanted to go. The difference between them and everybody else is that they're willing to do to get what they want, what the unsuccessful aren't willing to do. And that is to be disciplined. That is to practice, you know, uh, thinking effectively, to practice feeling good and being happy, to practice making good choices to really self-examine your thoughts and be willing to let go of all the ones that are ineffective and outdated. And that make that makes sense? It makes perfect sense to me, Les. So, I, mean, I, I, I think that's just a fantastic analogy. Back, back to your question, though, about procrastination, Keith. If you came to me and I didn't know you and you were asking me about procrastination, the first thing I would want to know is do you have a – a compelling why. In other words, is what you see out here, where you're headed, is it compelling? Is it is it clear? If that's clear and compelling, then I know where to start. Because all you really need is some structure to help you get there. Hmm. If the picture is not clear, then we got another problem altogether. And we need to work on making the picture clear and helping you define your why and helping you align and helping you identify and define and prioritize your values. Two different scenarios, right? One is the picture's not clear, so nothing's pulling me in that direction. You know, when I look in my mind's eye and I think about where I'm headed, man, there's this glorious picture on the horizon that's so compelling, it's pulling me towards it. 
Most people don't live with that kind of vision because they don't have the discipline and haven't been taught how to, how to build a vision like that. Mm -hmm. So I wake up in the morning knowing that I'm going to encounter challenges and hardships, but it's okay because my vision is so clear it'll pull me right through those things, whatever they are. If somebody's vision is really, really clear, but there's still problems with procrastination and, and getting distracted, then it's always a lack of structure and discipline. And so then we, what we do is we just put in place a structure that is like a recipe, like a strategy that will give them a, a, a set of activities to engage in every day, day in and day out without fail. And then I hold them accountable to it until it becomes ingrained. Mm. Until that becomes the track that they run on day after day after day. And for some people it can happen pretty fast. For other people it takes time. Yeah. I suppose it's like rebooting a computer. It is. Basically what you're doing is, is learning to, to rethink the, the probably the most important parts of your life. Oh, I, I agree, Keith. And you know something else that we haven't touched on yet, and it's vital to to feeling really, really good and to being happy. And that is, you got to unplug from all of the weak, deluded, sick, perverted, disgusting, evil forms of information that are polluting your psychology. I mean, I haven't watched the news in probably 15 years. And I'm just as up on what's going on as everybody else out there. The only difference is the news doesn't have the ability to incite unhappiness and anger in me because I'm not plugged into it. If I want to know something about what's going on, I know how to get it in the cleanest form possible without all the spin and all the bullshit that pollutes people's psychology and causes them to feel really bad. I'm unplugged from talk radio. I, you know, I got mm -hmm. plugged into talk radio about, uh, 20 years ago. And about 15 years ago, I woke up and I realized, man, every time I plug in and listen to this, it incites me to anger. It makes me mad. I get seething. And I, I just decided, no more. This is not how I want to live my life. So I unplugged and immediately started feeling better. I mean, yeah. the moment that I, um, the very next day, Keith, I felt better. TV is another example. Mm -hmm. So much of what's on the television is, is pure garbage. That doesn't mean I don't watch TV. Yeah. Because there are shows on TV that I'm a real fan of, and I find a lot of metaphors and analogies for helping people from watching the right kind of shows. But here's the way I do it. I record everything, and I use that fast-forward button to blast past all the commercials so that, that those commercials aren't programming my mind with bullshit messages. Yeah. Because if you believe the commercials, Keith, I'm supposed to be taking Prozac and Zantac and Ambien and erectile dysfunction medicine, and I'm supposed to have my prostate checked every year, I'm supposed to do this, and I'm supposed to do that because, oh my God, I'm 53 years old. That's BS. Mm -hmm. It's negative programming that does not help me feel good and be happy and, and go after what it is that I want in my life. Yeah. So I, I made a decision 15 years ago that I was going to unplug from Everything and anything. That meant people. That meant television. That meant radio. That meant certain songs. That meant anything that had the ability to make me feel bad, mm -hmm. unhappy, and keep me from moving in the direction that I want to move to go after what I want to go after. Fantastic. And, and that. And, and I'm I'm conscious looking at the clock that we're starting to get short on time. And this brings us nicely into uh, what will be my final question. And in the opening, you, you showed us an exercise about smiling and sitting up straight, and, and which is just fantastic. Are there other exercises, other things that people can do that can make them feel better about themselves or make them feel more happy? That's a great, great question. You know, if you don't have – yeah, I'm not going to impose my beliefs on somebody else. I believe in God, and I believe in praying to God, and I believe in praying – as if my prayers are going to be answered. I used to question whether or not they were. And then I just made the decision, you know what, I'm going to pray as if they're going to be answered. And I've been practicing that for long enough now that when I pray, I feel really confident that my prayers are going to get answered. So that's one. The other part of praying might be meditate. And I do meditate. I love to meditate. It's a big part of my day, day in and day out. 
And when I don't, I'm less organized in my thinking uh, throughout the day. So I make it a habit to meditate. And I follow that structure that I've, that I've written out because it keeps me on point. Uh, great, uh, gratitude, Keith, is maybe the most important thing that a person can practice to help them feel better and to, and to be happy. And there's so many things to be grateful for. You know, I, I, I shared somewhere in the comments earlier, and somebody came back in and said something about it. I said, you, you find what you look for. In other words, people come into Google Plus and they're looking for reasons to be mad, to be upset, and to, and to get unhappy. And there are people who come into Google Plus who are looking for reasons to feel great, looking for people that they can connect with and, and, and enjoy time with. And there are people who go out onto the highway and they're looking for traffic to get snarled up so that they can get pissed off and shoot birds at everybody, right? You, you find what you go looking for. So making the shift to looking for things to be grateful for is a great practice to develop, and it'll help you become happy and feel good about your life in probably a greater way than anything else that you can do. Uh, Exercise. Dude, I, listen, I'm a fitness nut. And this year, I'm taking my fitness to a level that will put me in the 1 100th one percent per percentile of people on the planet, much less people my age. I'm trying to do fitness routines that, that exceed gravity. <laughs> and I'm intent that I'm going to conquer them, that I'm going to win. Uh, I'll be sharing details on that as the year progresses, but fitness is a really great way mm -hmm. to ramp up and dial up the way that you feel and make, help yourself feel better. Uh, of course, getting enough sleep is vital, and if you're not getting enough sleep, the negative effects are, I can't even begin to count them all. They're just, they're horrific, and you need, you need to get help so that you can get enough sleep. You need to get somebody like me to help you untangle your thoughts and put some structure in place so that you can lay your head down on the pillow at night and go off into sound deep sleep. Or you need to go to a sleep specialist or to your doc somewhere and find help so that you can sleep the way that you're supposed to sleep. Because if you're not, something is out of alignment in here and it just needs to be adjusted. Uh, of course, doing things you enjoy. You know, I said earlier in the show, I love to skip and dance, and I mean, my wife, she thinks I'm silly, but I'll be holding her hand in the mall when we're walking, we'll, we'll just start skipping all of a sudden, because it makes me feel good. Uh, I jump up and down in rain puddles from time to time. I'll walk out into the, into the thunderstorm and look up in the sky and catch raindrops on my tongue. Uh, right? I mean, do those things that can make you feel good, because... Mm -hmm. Life's too short to feel miserable. And if we've got to go through life anyway, make the choice to go through it and enjoy yourself. Uh, of course, you got to schedule time to relax, Keith. Yeah. You know, uh, the Sabbath is there for a reason. It gives us a chance to reboot and recalibrate and, and to rest up and to recover so that we have all of ourselves available to direct at our lives starting first thing Monday morning or you know, the next day, whatever your Sabbath is. You know, for a long time, my Sabbath was Saturday because I found that I could be very effective helping people on Sunday. Mm. And so I just modified my schedule so that Sabbath could be Saturday. And, you know, that's something that I have to discipline myself to do because I'm kind of high, alpha male driven. Uh, and that was one of those things that, I mean, I could work seven days a week, 15 hours a day, and burn myself completely out and not even know that I was doing it. So I had to put the structure in place and practice relaxing. Uh, and, of course, there's other things. I mean, you can get a massage, take a bubble bath, uh, an occasional, I think an occasional glass of wine is a really good way to, to chill. Uh, and, of course, if you go to YouTube and you click on the search box, and you type in the search box, the science of happiness, or Sam Burns' philosophy for living a happy life, and watch those two videos, especially Sam Burns' philosophy for living a happy life. He's one of about 350 people in the world 
to have a very debilitating disease that that prevented him from from growing. He's bald all over. Uh, he's 17. I think he just recently died. Mm. But he he does a TED talk and he talks about his philosophy for living a happy life. And if you watch that and can't make some adjustments in your thinking to be happier directly following watching that video, then you've got serious problems and you really do need to get some help. Mm. <laughs> because that video will change your life. Fantastic. So what I'll say, Liz, is thank you from the bottom of my heart for letting me be a guest, a guest host on your show. It's just been probably one of the best hours I've spent with my clothes on for a <laughs> long, long time. So w what I'll do is I'll, I'll hand the rest of it over to you, uh, okay. but I, I, can, I, I can't thank you enough for asking me about a, a ball. You're, you're welcome, Keith, and it was an honor to have you. I, I really enjoyed getting to know you, and I look forward to getting to know you better, and hopefully within the next year or two, there'll be a trip to the UK, and then you and I will get to meet. Uh, that will be live. wonderful. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I said I would leave the show open to answer questions. Uh, if you'll use the question and answer box, Keith and I are going to stay live and, and answer those questions. But I have a couple of uh, things I want to wrap up with. Number one, I'll be creating a resource page with links to some things that you can click on and go to to help you if you're not especially feeling good and you're not especially happy. Uh, this might be a first step for you. So I'll share that resource page with you after I've responded to all the comments and answered all the question and answers and recovered a little bit. Uh, the, the next thing I want to say is that Keith and I both have an offer that we want to make to the audience. Uh, I don't know, this isn't how I make my living, Keith, doing these shows. I make my living mm. coaching and consulting, helping people. Uh, this is free gratis, man. This is this is pro bono. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm glad to do it. I really am. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, somebody out there will point a sponsor in my direction and they'll pick up the, you know, the cost for the time and, and uh, that would be wonderful. I, I'm expecting that to happen. Uh, but I'm going to make a special offer tonight. If you'll, if, if you if you want some help, and I offer help in in several different forms. I offer if you're already achieving some success and you just need a little more structure and accountability. I have a mastermind and accountability group. It's you have to pay that you can join, and that'll be very helpful in helping you break through some of those barriers and be more intentional. I have group coaching, which is a much more affordable way to get coached. Uh, I have one-off coaching, which is the most expensive way to get coached. That means you reach out to me and say, hey, I need a one-hour coaching session or 75 minutes coaching session. That's the most expensive way. And then I have individual term coaching. So I'm gonna, if you'll private message me or email me with the code feel good and be happy, I'll give you a 50% discount off of any of those services. Uh, that's a pretty good offer, but it's only good for 24 hours. So when you know the, the the show is officially over, the clock will start ticking, and 24 hours from now the offer will will end. And I'm going to do this maybe one or two more times, and then I'll quit making the offer because, uh, well, anyway. So there there's my offer. I know Keith has a a special offer at the Social Marketing Academy. It's uh, what is it? Engage Keith. It is. It's our uh, social marketing program. It's a, a six to eight week program that really gets you back on track for uh, for social marketing. And at the moment, what I'm going to do for for all the guys that have been out on the hangout who uh, who, who want to take advantage of it, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to knock uh, $340 off it. So instead wow. of paying the normal $497 that it is for the six to eight week course, it's only going to cost you 157 but very much like Les, and, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll put a link into the chat box where you can go uh, to, to have a look, see what we do, uh, where you can sign up, but uh, like Les said, this is probably only going to last uh, UK time till midnight tomorrow night for us, um, so there's, there's a, little, a little countdown on there, there's everything that you need to know, so what I'll do is I'll just click that link into the box and share it, uh, and you can see it there, and and but what I want you to do, folks, is just remember 
th there is a time limit on it, and then it will go back to its normal price. So just head on over and take a look. Right on. Yeah. And as a as a closing sort of call to action for this segment of the show, I want to ask anybody else who's still present in the audience to uh, do exactly the same thing that you did in the opening call to action, and that is sit up straight. You know, throw your shoulders back, lift your chin up, eye straight ahead, and smile from earlobe to earlobe as big as you can, because it's really hard to feel bad when you do that. I find that as soon as I start to do that, I start to laugh. Yeah. You, you yeah. can't, I, I can't help it. It's hard. To, I mean, you can't feel miserable if you're smiling really big, can you, Keith? I totally agree. I, I, I think it's one of the most underrated things is smiling. I agree. And what's really cool about it is if you do it in, a com in the company of other people, it infects them, and the next thing you know, you got everybody smiling and feeling better. So, <laughs> there's a fantastic video on on YouTube where it shows a woman on a on a uh, a bus in London, and she looks. It must be a text message or a, or whatever on her phone, and she just starts laughing, and really quickly the whole coach just starts to laugh. It's right on. So infectious. Right on. I love it. Well, hey, I, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, Keith, I'm going to go ahead and, and answer some of these questions. I see Jason's asking how to start breaking down the walls to your comfort zone. And, you know, I would say to, because I know Jason pretty well now, uh, in fact, Jason's in one of my mastermind groups, that, you know, the key, first of all, is to make sure that you, that your picture is compelling, that it's clear. And if that's clear and you've done that work, then put the structure in place and or what I would call or term the strategy. You know, a lot of people go through life very tactical. I mean, they'll try this and that, that doesn't work, they'll try this. And if that doesn't work, they'll try this. And so they're all over the place. And what you need is a, is a, a strategy, a path to run on. It includes this activity and this one and this one and this one and this one. And you do those every day, day in and day out, without fail, with great intent. And what I mean by that is, Tomorrow, because I've measured my performance today, I know how much more I'm going to go for tomorrow. So I'm going to reach a little further tomorrow than I did today. But now, see, that requires what? It requires discipline. you got to set your intentions on, okay, because I was able to lift 15 pounds today 10 times, tomorrow I want to lift 15 pounds 11 times. Or I want to jump up to the next level of weight and lift that same amount of weight 10 times. What you'll find out is that you can't. But if you continue working that, you'll eventually get to where you can. You'll break through that, that, uh, that barrier or that comfort zone. Uh, you know, a comfort zone is a strange thing too, Jason. It's got all kinds of uh, variables to it. You know, uh, so... And I'm probably not doing this question justice because when I think about a comfort zone, I think about somebody who's telling themselves over and over again that where they are is okay. That, uh, you know, the patterns that exist in their life currently are okay. And if, it, if they're not taking any new action, then it becomes really evident that that is the truth. The problem with comfort zones is that people delude themselves, right? They... Uh, don't see it clearly. And so sometimes it, it takes the help of somebody like a, a coach or a mentor or a friend or a book or an audio, audio program, something, some new information to affect the way that you think and cause you to ask different questions than you're asking yourself. So that's, uh, that's my answer to that question. Let me give you an example. I had a comfort zone in my fitness wherein you know, I had a routine down where I could outwork most of the people in the gym, even the people much younger than me, because I've been at it so long, and I had a really high pain threshold. So for me to go into the gym and work my butt off, and it looked like I'm doing far more than everybody else in the gym was easy. The problem was I plateaued. I wasn't growing anymore, because that effort, my body had adjusted to it. To get past that comfort zone, I had to start doing things differently. And just because that's the way that I'm wired and because my picture is so clear, I began looking for routines that I couldn't do and started going after them. And 
when I started going after them in the beginning, my my uh, experience was that they were completely impossible, meaning that I couldn't do them at all. Well, the way that my mind works, I processed that lack of being able to do it on my own and said, wait a minute, if that person can do it, his success is leaving clues. I need to find out what he did to get to the where he is. And I reverse engineered it and backed it up to, okay, what's the smallest movement that I can make or that I can take that will help me move towards being able to accomplish this. And I started doing those little tiny movements. And little by little, day by day, I got stronger and stronger, and those muscles that needed to be developed to do that routine began to form. And eventually I got to where I could do a small percentage of those routines. And that's the path that I'm on now. I'm doing these routines to break through comfort zones and barriers between me and being able to complete it completely successfully. So, <clears throat> I think that answers that question completely. Uh, you know, I'm not following the instructions that, uh, that Stephen gave me earlier, which would be to click on this select button so that the question pops up so people know what I'm ans answering. Uh, yeah, Tina says uh, in the comments, my mood's tied directly to whether I exercise or not. Most important action as far as I'm concerned. I completely agree, Tina. Uh, the more disciplined you are in following a routine, the more structure you have in following a routine, the better you can feel day after day after day. And, you know, I, Keith and I had this conversation in the green room before the show ever started. The majority of people on the planet don't know how good they can feel. Even the people who feel good don't know how good they can feel because they've gotten to a place where feeling good is okay. Instead of seeing in going after, how good can I feel? How much happiness can I take? And i got to tell you, that's been my intention now for the last couple of years. I want to dial it up until it's so intense that, that when people see me, man, I look like I'm on fire. And, you know, I want them to come over and get close to me so they'll burn because I want everybody to be happy and feel good. So good stuff, uh, Tina. Let's see. Carolyn says the comfort zone is telling themselves over and over again that where they are is okay. Yeah, Carolyn, uh, so true. You know, we, we have to tell ourselves something different if we want something different in our lives. You can't keep telling yourself the same things and doing the same things because you're going to keep getting what you've been getting. That's the, that's the rule. So <clears throat> I, I have this sort of dominant thought in my mind all the time. It's if I change the way I look at things, the things I look at change. If I change the way I think about things, the things I think about change. So when I think about a comfort zone or I think about a barrier that's in my life or a hardship or a challenge, if the way that I'm looking at it isn't allowing me to move forward, isn't allowing me to advance around it or under it or through it, then i got to change the way that I'm looking at it so that I can see things that I can't currently see, which is the explanation that I gave a minute ago concerning the fitness thing. You know, I plateaued. As far as I was concerned, that wasn't good enough. I wanted to take it someplace that I'd never been. So I had to change the way that I was viewing my fitness routine. And that allowed me to break through the barrier. So good stuff. Let's see what else we got here. Keith, there's a question in here for you. How did you make the decision to let go of the lesser to embrace the greater? You could have talked yourself into remaining in your comfort zone, but you did not. You want to feel that one? Sorry, Les, you were just a bit fuzzy there, Matt. Can you say that again? Let me uh, let me put that up here. Where did it go? Because I, 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 I can't see what the chat is. Okay, it says, so Keith, uh, how did you make the decision, and this is from JD, how did you make the decision to let go of the lesser to embrace the greater? You, you could have talked yourself into remaining in your comfort zone, and it was probably pretty comfortable, but you didn't. Why, why did you, uh, what, what did you have to do to break through it? I think it's, well, Well, first of all, it, it's probably a two-party question because the first thing was that uh, I realized that I was in a comfort zone and I needed to get out of it because I think w one of the things that um, that really struck me was that, and, and like I said before, where it's uh, good stops us from being great. I think if you get good at something, 
and people continually tell you that you're good at something, be it, you know, for me it was art and drumming and, and a few other things, is that you don't really progress. So what I realized really quite quickly was to progress, I had to make the decision to move forward, to get out of my comfort zone. And once I had made that decision, I did everything in my power to make it happen. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's probably one of the, the, the things that I, that I take out of it, is that I actually made that decision. It was a conscious decision to, to change because, yeah. and again, if you don't, you, you get stuck in the same old rut. Yeah, which goes back to the conversation we were having earlier, really, uh, J.D., is it's a, it's a decision. It's a choice. And once you throw your hand up and say, look, I am not staying in this mediocrity any longer. I'm not staying at this level any longer. I'm going to the next level. Then an amazing thing happens in that your vision takes in more than it was capable of taking in before. Resources present themselves that weren't visible before. New uh, ways of thinking about uh, your situation suddenly appear and they weren't there before because you made the decision. So, you know, it, it, people need to realize that we live in a world that is organized under a set of universal laws, and one of them is the law of cause and effect. And the way the world, the way the law of cause and effect works is, I have a thought, it creates a feeling, good or bad. That feeling compels me to make a choice and to take an action, and that action creates a result. And the result's either going to be good or bad. It's either going to be effective or ineffective. It's either going to be right or wrong, based on what? Based on the original thought. So it's in my best interest to organize my thoughts in such a way that I feel good and I'm happy more than the opposite because I know, I mean, it's self-evident that when I feel good, I make better decisions. When I feel good, I take better actions. And so that would be the answer to that question, uh, J.D., now we have another one here from uh, Rexos, um, Rexos Scarecrow. Okay, nice, cool name. This process of reevaluating oneself to realize the thought process is available to a person of any age, literally meaning that a 20-year-old can make this decision or a 70-year-old. Is this assessment correct? I absolutely agree. You know, the world, and what I mean by the world is this collective consciousness that's out here will attempt to hem you in and imprison you in your own virtual prison and keep you from going after what you want in life. And it's, it's evident everywhere you look. If you listen to the television programming, if you listen to the news, if you pay attention to conversations that you have with other people, they're all conditioned to sort of grind it out for 30 years and then retire to the rocking chair and then die. And I say to hell with all that. Where is it written that that's the way you got to live your life? You know, I'm 53 years old, and I'm reinventing myself every day. I'm not, I apologize. I'm not 53 yet. May 22nd, I'll be 53. I'm re reinventing my life every single day. And I have more zeal and more passion and more stamina and more energy and more focus today than I had when I was 40 when I was 20, when I was 18. So, I, you know, I think the answer to your question, Rexos, is absolutely. You're absolutely correct. Uh, it's never too late to recreate yourself. It's never too late to do a self-examination. The time is always now. So, good Sorry, question, Les. Rexos. Sorry, Les, can I, I would just add to the end of that, is that, that for me, I mean, I'm, I'm 56 now. I was 56 a, a week or so ago, and and one of the things that I live by is that I don't let the beliefs and decisions that I, that I held in the past become the prison of the future. Yeah. Because you can you can definitely be hemmed in by what people think a fifty plus year old should be doing. Yeah. And and that's just like total BS to me. It's you 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 know, it's as I I said to Jane, my gorgeous wife, I'm only as as young as the woman I fail. And right. that's pretty much the way that I live. You don't don't let what you know your past beliefs were or what people made you believe trick you into believing. 
May I so agree? I so agree with that, Keith. You know, I was having a conversation with JD again earlier, and one of the things I said is, if you let yourself on fire, people come watch you burn. It doesn't matter how old you are. Yeah. Right? I mean, a twenty-year-old could become CEO of a company if he's if he's got the wisdom and the knowledge and the attitude, the self-confidence that he belongs in that role. Just like a seventy-year-old could go go back. He could recreate himself and become the CEO of a major corporation if, if that's what he wanted to do. Now, I can't imagine anybody wanting to do that myself. But it's never too late in life to make the decision that you're going to go after what it is that you want in your life. The only thing between you and it is your attitude about yourself, your belief about yourself. If I decide right now that I want to become a brain surgeon and I fix my intention on becoming a brain surgeon, then the resources and the thinking and the opportunities and the and the knowledge and the understanding and the all of that stuff will begin to present itself mm -hmm. as long as I decide to take that path and burn my boats and don't look back. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to be a brain surgeon. I I want to do this kind of brain surgery. This is, <laughs> this is this is the stuff I enjoy doing. So, all right. Next question. I have one from another one from uh, this is from Sheila Strover. And this one says, Les, how often do you find in your clients that being stuck begins with a bereavement? It's, uh, you know, it's, it's more common than you think. And bereavement doesn't necessarily mean the death of a loved one or a friend or could be the death of a, of a job. It could be the death of a, uh, you know, it could be the death of my house rolled over on top of me and I went into foreclosure and now i got to move. Uh, those kind of things happen a lot, frequently. And some of them can be pretty overwhelming. And so, you know, I said in the opening line of the show that I helped a CEO navigate, basically helped him navigate hell. He was $11 million, uh, the size of his business. He had 100 employees, a couple million dollars in debt to the tax man. Uh, his banks were ready to call his loans. And, and uh, that's a pretty heavy burden to bear. He felt a lot of shame. He felt a lot of of uh, guilt and I mean, he quite literally didn't know what to do. Uh, he spent most of the time in a, in a, in a pool of tears. And I'm talking about a rough and tough kind of guy, you know? So when you, when you get in that state, you, if you can't see a way to get yourself untangled on your own, you got to reach out and find somebody who can help you. And one of my specialties is it's like a, I had a conversation with Stephen Fuel before the show. I said, you know, there's varying degrees of being stuck. Obviously, if I can help a guy by reaching over and taking an invisible pair of suitcases from his hands and setting them down and helping him walk away from them and get him unstuck doing that, his level of being stuck wasn't that great. He was ready to let go of those suitcases and move on with his life. So it was pretty easy for me to help him get unstuck. The CEO, on the other hand, was so mired in, in real-time, you know, challenges and hardships and so tangled up in his thinking concerning it all that I couldn't help him in a single session. That took time. So, yeah, uh, happens all the time, Sheila, and uh, it's, it, it gives me no greater pleasure than to help somebody get untangled from all that. Let's see, here's another one from, let's see, my takeaway was that I can't sacrifice my dreams for everyone. I will invest in me, whether my kids, my lover, or my family like it or not. They can either join in or not. You know, I want to speak to that one uh, because it's especially dear to my heart. I felt for many years that I was being required to conform to those around me. And so I, I in my own way, uh, walked on eggshells to satisfy and please everybody around me. And it's a horrible way to live your life. Uh, you know, in my backstory that I shared with Christine on her hangout, I had the, the luxury of being introduced to unconditional love by my wife, and it freed me from all of that and enabled me to spread my wings and fly and, and be who I believe God created me to be. And it changed my life. And, and it's helped me get to the place now where Keith and, and JD and anybody else who's watching, I've been practicing loving other people, and I mean people I don't even know, in advance of ever even meeting them, so that when I encounter them, 
it doesn't matter how they behave. I love them. And, you know, there's an old saying that uh, you have to love everybody, but you don't have to like them. I even like them. Even if they're, even if they're miserable people, I like them. Does it take practice? Does it take a choice for me to like them? Absolutely. But the way I look at it is I was put on this planet to help everybody I can experience a little more freedom and a little more happiness and feel a little bit better. And the only way I can do that is to make that choice. So I've been practicing it long enough now where I'm extending the same unconditional love that was given to me to everybody that I encounter. What I mean by that, and the answer to J.D.'s question more succinctly, is that our relationship should be held in our hand like, like I'm holding my phone in my hand, right? But so often they're, they're, they're bound up in a lot of illegitimate thoughts and agreements, and, and nobody can move. They're hemmed in by these, by these you know, ineffective ways of looking at the relationship. I want my wife to be able to come and go. If she decides someday that you know, she doesn't like being with me, I need her to be free to go. Now, that's never going to happen because I give her a lot of freedom, and she does me. And the wonderful thing about that is, is that if I give her that freedom, she can be who she needs to be and doesn't feel any pressure from me in the relationship, which makes it possible for me to interact with her in a loving manner. There's never a fight between my wife and I, never. She doesn't fight with me, and I don't fight with her. We wake up in the morning with smiles on our face. We love on each other all day long because we've learned how to live with each other in the most effective manner, and we, we're practicing it to get even better at it. And so as it relates to and my takeaway that I can't sacrifice my dreams for anyone, I will invest in me, whether my kids, my love, my lover, or my family like it or not, they can either join me or not, is, is accurate. But I, I want to put in, or I want to add this, this uh, line of thinking to it, J.D. Love them exactly where they are, exactly as they are, whether they support you or not. Allow them to be cynical. Allow them to be mediocre. Allow them to be whatever it is that they currently are and be okay with that and just be you. Go after what it is that you want in life, whether they support you or not. So I hope that helps. Okay, there's a comment to a comment I made. All right, I think that's all. Let's see. I think that's all the questions, Keith. It looks like we wrapped it up. Fantastic. At least all the questions in the Q&A. Man, I don't know. What do you think? Did we have a good time? I think we had a fantastic time. Did we? You think we helped anybody? I think we helped. Going by the questions and going by the comments that's come under the uh, under the events page, I think we've done a really good job, mate. Well, you have. I've asked the questions. You've answered everything so beautifully and fully. It's uh, it's just been a pleasure to be on. Like, why? You know what? It's interesting because it helped me. Good. Uh, I think if we can get something out of everything that we do, then why not? Right on. Well, listen, I'm going to go ahead and end the broadcast, and then I'll go right to the event page and interact with people via the uh, the chat stream or the comment stream. Fantastic. Keith, hey, Keith, thanks for joining me. I know this is uh, your, uh, approaching your bedtime, isn't it? <laughs> uh, no, but okay yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good evening, brother. You too. Take care. I see you.